and concluded yesterday morning. My colleague, Lee Fithian, here on the front row, and is an associate professor of architecture, and also Fineth Jernigan, author of Big Bim, Little Bim, are here to present the results from Bim Storm Oklahoma City with me. Kimon Onuma, architect and creator of the Onuma system, is joining us virtually from California. Um, he, his presence, he will be present. We may not actually uh, get to hear from Kimon today, but he is uh, listening in uh, and has helped in uh, preparing our presentation for today. We're also very honored to have Russell Klaus here, the director of the planning department uh, for Oklahoma City, and members from his team, uh, Brandon Milland and Chris Varga. AJ Kirkpatrick is here from downtown Oklahoma City. And uh, also, thank you for joining us. Um, I'm going to kick off the presentation uh, with some background information. And then when I'm finished, we're going to ask Russell Klaus to um, provide you all with some, um, some of the history of the area, the district we have been working on in. Before he does, though, uh, I want to provide you all with the background information of BIMSWARM, Oklahoma City. This was made possible uh, through the University of Oklahoma City's Dream Course Program. It is a competitive program sponsored by the provost for faculty seeking to enhance an existing uh, course at the university. Um, the uh, slide you guys are currently seeing on the screen is uh, one that's located and gives you the detailed uh, story about uh, Lee Fithian and I's um, vision for this film store, Oklahoma City, and how we approached it uh, with our proposal. But the program um, is, is intended to provide funding uh, necessary to enhance a um, current course in the university. So Lee and I uh, joined forces and um, uh, proposed for uh, the college architecture and construction science students. Uh, members in the fourth year architecture studio, students from the uh, senior level BIM for constructors, and then also some graduate students from uh, our graduate level facilities acquisition planning course were involved. We had a total of 67 students that were enrolled in the courses and participated um, with 27 teams. Uh, I want to highlight though uh, our primary objective for the course was to enhance interdisciplinary collaboration between the students in the college. And I think Lee and I would both agree that we accomplished that, at least with the students that uh, participated in BIMSTORM with the process and the projects. The uh, journey uh, for Lee and I in uh, preparing the courses in BIMSTORM uh, began a year ago this month when um, I approached her and said, hey, I've got this idea. How about we team up and um, uh, put together a BIM storm for Oklahoma City? Um, this was our seventh collaborative uh, teaching effort uh, together. And I'm glad that after all those previous times, she still agreed to join in. Um, from the beginning, there was no question that the project for BIMSTORM should be situated in Oklahoma City, and that we wanted the planning department as a partner. So even before submitting our proposal for the, uh, to the provost for the Dream Course, uh, she and I met with Russell Klaus and, and his team to identify an area in particular that they uh, saw a need for this type of activity. Uh, and um, we agreed that uh, it would be a great uh, location would be the River District, which is an area in the master plan Port Shore area between I-40 and Oklahoma River. It was an area with a great need to build community and enhance connectivity with the current uh, relocation of I-40 um, and some of the uh, redevelopment uh, challenges that the area may face going forward. So. Our whole uh, approach was to uh, have this contextualized uh, project for the students. And uh, the planning department throughout the last year has been very valuable 
to the success of BIMS Form Oklahoma City. And for that, we would, Lee and I would like to thank you all for helping us. Um, we have a number of students here in the room uh, that participated, and uh, they can probably tell you more uh, intimate stories about their participation and what their teams did. But for the time being, I'm just going to highlight that um, the teams, uh, the students were assigned to an interdisciplinary team on the first day of class back in August this semester. And in the end, we wound up with uh, 26 teams with a distribution of either two or three members per team. The um, interdisciplinary aspect were with the architecture and construction students, but the entire BIM storm uh, activity was open to anyone who wanted to participate. Since the beginning of the semester, though, the students have collaborated on the design and construction activities for their project in BIM storm. And in addition to the instruction that they received about the technical aspects relevant uh, to performing the role of architect or performing the role of construction manager on an integrated project, uh, teamwork and collaboration were emphasized using team ex exercises and even a design build charrette uh, activity prior to BIM Storm so they could actually start experiencing uh, working together and having um, to produce real deliverables. Throughout the process, communication between team members was a priority. So today in the presentation, you all um, will see some uh, highlighted uh, student projects that we, are, uh, we have selected because throughout the semester, we saw evidence that uh, there was an ongoing collaborative effort. The first four projects you will see are outcomes from the undergraduate teams, and the fifth project represents outcomes from one of the graduate teams. Undergraduate student teams were required to work together in the context of an integrated team, with the architects providing their construction team member with the design concepts, materials, and building systems information beginning in the schematic phase. An iterative process of information and feedback was stressed as critical for pre-construction activities. The construction students provided feedback based on their design reviews at different points along um, the progression of development. They had some, uh, some things to say about value engineering ideas, uh, constructability review, report, cost analysis, and different scheduling activities. But the primary objective and the the main selection for criteria for selecting the projects today were the ones that demonstrated true collaboration. And this, in turn, uh, met the goal of our uh, drink force with enhancing the students' participation in these teams and in BIMSTORM Oklahoma City. The fifth student project highlighted today is one of the graduate student projects. Uh, which is a study of three alternate schemes for the redevelopment of the Hubcap Alley area in River District. So it's a little bit different. They had a different program and different requirement as far as for the course that they had to, uh, to focus on. So you're going to see a little bit of different uh, results there. But they focused on the history of the area with a market analysis um, based on the program provided by Oklahoma City and this guided their design and recommendations for the area. During the BIM Storm event on Wednesday and since, students have received very, some really, really great feedback about their team's work and their development progress on their projects from Brandon Milan, and thank you for that. He's a planner from the Oklahoma City Planning Department. He spent a number of hours in the past uh, day or so looking at the projects and commenting directly to the students through the Onuma system. In addition to student team uh, projects, we also had industry teams actively participating, and some will be highlighted today. We had uh, active uh, industry teams from J.E. Dunn, Austin Commercial, FSB Architects, Manhattan Construction, Craft and & Toll, and, and Balfour Baby. Um, so you're going to see some of the highlights from their team. Um, so really, that uh, that highlight that um, uh, is a overview of the projects you're going to see today. 
And I want to thank you all for being here and your interest in uh, the results that we have from FemStorm OKC. It's been a really valuable interdisciplinary learning event for our students as they prepare to be professionals in the building industry. So with that said, I want to uh, introduce Russell Klaus, the uh, planning director of Oklahoma City, and uh, ask him to say a few words and give us some of their background information and participation in the project. Thank you, Sam. Are we recording this so I should stay in one place? Um, you know, I'm, I'm really excited to be part of this. I was very, uh, uh, you know, I didn't know exactly what, I didn't have any clue what Boomstorm was when Tammy and Lee first introduced the idea that as they explained how it functioned and what it was intended to accomplish, it became pretty obvious that this was a really valuable tool. Um, and I know this is the first major effort with this uh, at OU, but I would anticipate clearly that this is going to be a valuable tool for uh, planning and design uh, in, in a national sense. Uh, I'm excited about the number of people who participated, both the students and faculty at OU, but uh, everybody from everywhere else, wherever they may be, uh, we appreciate your input into this process. Um, even if you've never been here before, a lot of the planning principles are fairly universal in their application, so um, we appreciate your input. Uh, I'm also excited because of the relationship that we are building between the City of Oakland City Planning Department and the City in general with OU. I think that's been a relationship that has uh, not been optimized in the past. And I'm very grateful for the opportunity to work with uh, me, Tammy, but also with Blair, the Institute for Quality Communities, and Dean Graham has also expressed his support in the past for this effort. So uh, I think this heralds a, a new period of cooperation that will be extremely beneficial to both of us because, uh, one, we don't have enough planning and design capacity, and probably never will, and here's this phenomenal resource uh, just down the road, and we need to take advantage of that. And, and on, from your perspective, to have that real world experience, I think, is, is absolutely critical to work on projects that uh, we're currently working on that we need answers on. Uh, I, I don't think you can get better at better experience than that. And um, I'm also excited because uh, this area offers so much opportunity for our home city in the long term. It has been an area that has been a back door for Oklahoma City for a long period of time. And, but if you look at its geographic juxtaposition between the river, which we've now invested in and beginning to see changes occurring there uh, that are bringing us international prominence, uh, and what is happening in the downtown area, it is ideally positioned uh, to for redevelopment. Not so that it's going to happen automatically. There's still a cultural change in Oklahoma City about urbanizing, uh, but that trend is, is gaining momentum. We uh, uh, recently completed a downtown housing study that indicated there's significant demand out there. Even the developers who have just completed projects are aware, based on the fact that they opened them full, um, which rarely occurs, um, but they are aware that there's significant unmet demand. And I believe we have that demand for another couple of thousand units of market rate rental. But I believe there's also an emerging market for for sale housing. And there is no product in the downtown area, even the more expensive units that um, have been on the market for some time and now, my, that I'm aware of, have, have recently sold. So we've got no product at all. So we're a little behind the game plan. And that's why this site is, is interesting because of its location. And uh, we split this as for the shore area. Um, we do have consultants that are on contract with the Alliance for Economic Development who are uh, 
identifying what the options are for development on the north side of the new highway. But this south side, we have at this point in time, generally not directed much attention to. So this effort here, I think it's going to give us some uh, very interesting ideas about what the possibilities are for this area. And I'm really excited about that opportunity immediately adjacent to the river. Um, you know, just going back a little bit in terms of the history of it, the foreshore process, uh, a lot of people believe began out of the relocation of I 40. That was certainly one of the triggers for that. I 40 was relocated five blocks south from its current location, um, correcting, marginally correcting uh, a major area, uh, a major era of the Federal Transportation Department many years ago. Um, so we took it from elevated to what we hope would be a depressed uh, viaduct that is now uh, pretty much at grade. So we're still suffering from those same separation issues because of this uh, major piece of infrastructure. Nevertheless, I do think that the location amenities, the proximity to downtown, the view of the downtown skyline, the adjacency to the river, um, the adjacency to this new major public infrastructure investment in the park uh, are sufficient to begin to attract attention to the area. What's missing at this point in time is anything down there to represent what those possibilities are. So the moment that happens, I begin, I believe that we begin to see uh, people um, change their, uh, their understanding of, of what the area is and what its future may be. Uh, it's a large area. Um, it's, as I said, been neglected for a long period of time. Um, but I think it's time is coming. Um, we've got that, that demand. The biggest challenge for us is going to be able to, uh, is, is ensuring that we can be able to support that development financially and to ensure that we get the kind of mixed income community that I think is essential to the sustainability of that area over the long term. Um, I don't think I really have anything else to add at this point. Um, I, again, I'm just really excited about the fact that we are having this dialogue, we're using this technology to have this dialogue, that the different people who are involved are involved because we all have the interest of a better urban community at heart, and I'm greatly appreciative of everybody. Uh, participating in making that happen. If uh, <coughs> they're ready to go, the only thing that's been missing so far is the people who can lay out the vision for it. And you are all participating in that today. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank Hi, I'm, I'm fine at the Jurgen, and um, I guess in this operation, I'm uh, representing the Ajuba uh, Inc. My very good friend, Kong Mumba, was the guy who created the system that you're using to, to match up the data uh, for the different kinds of what we have. Uh, Kong created the system, as Tammy mentioned, and I've written a couple of books. I kind of focus on doing that, actually, in our future part in your office. That uh, I've been doing this since uh, the late 80s, 1980s. We've been doing it for a very, very long time. And um, I've uh, really, over the last few years, decided that the only way to get the word out is to actually start writing and talking about it. We're just for sort of letting you know that we're actually broadcasting this. Um, on the go to meeting, all that, that there's there's a lot of people who want to sign up for this. So we're trying to we're trying to juggle too many technologies. Okay, so um, in my books, I'm trying to focus on people who have never done this before. Okay, there, there's an awful lot of books out there in the high tech writing. You know how do you highly detailed part of this? But the collaborative parts, the, the parts that literally you can teach to a to your eight-year-old, there's not a whole lot of uh, out there. That's kind of book. That's kind of what I focus on. Um, my 
attention should the bank do? Maybe, I think a lot of the teams that work on this over here today want to, want to recognize and show them some of the stuff that you find really good in school. I mean, all the work was done in a very short period of time. So we're going to do that. But I also want to put this in the context of the time. Okay, because this is a big international and national and local thing that we're talking about. But this is not, this is not just a few got together and and uh, you know, did a did a days long uh, thing with students working all night. This is actually a really big deal, I think. Russell, when he's talking about uh, you know this is the future of where planning and design is going. This Tammy said earlier was really about collaboration. Now I'm you know, I I try to be optimistic all things, particularly this stuff because I've been looking at this one over. Years. I'm hoping that next year, the year after, we're back doing this, and we're not just talking about construction of students, architecture of students, but we're talking about real estate development of students. We're talking about bots. We're talking about environmental psychologists. Because those are the things that are happening in the rest of the world. Where you're not just dealing with two disciplines that are kind of connected, you're dealing with disciplines that just range from Canada to decision making. Okay. And that's where hopefully we're going. As you can see, we did a long prep for this. We had four webinars that just kind of showed how he was involved with this. On the seventh, we did the uh, we did the 24-hour effort. Now we're the ninth and actually on the twelfth. <laughs> Okay, I'm gonna go over here. Okay, so um, on the 12th, uh, and I, I assume Lee and we're everybody's in, what's the attend your review on the 12th is invited. Yeah, so um, so there's all uh, all that. And so if you want to go on the 12th, there is more going on. Um, okay, so put this in context. When I when I made my airplane ticket to come to Come down, come to Norman. I went on Expedia. I I said that hey, I want to fly in the morning. I want to be in in Oklahoma City by early afternoon. I want to go back, you know, middle of the day on Saturday. I want to get home before you know before the planes quit flying. And you know all those things, all those decision points. I went into Expedia and put into their system and hit a button, and the system kicked back a hundred options. That I had. I went through and made the, I looked at the options, picked the ones that suited me, hit a button and said, hey, buy this, put my credit card number in, I just died. Right? I have a ticket. All of you have probably done this at this point. That technology has replaced having to print books and having to, you know, you couldn't do that with a bunch of PDFs. You couldn't do that with Acrobat. If you try to print it out on paper and make a decision after you finish printing, all of the flights would already be booked and out of you wouldn't be able to do it. So it's it's basically real time, large scale decision making with a lot of, with where there's much 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 data. Literally, if you took the airport in Oklahoma City and printed out the schedule information to make the decisions that I made to get here, you would literally fill a small office with paper. Okay. So that same technology, that technology is all over the internet now. It's, everybody knows it, everybody uses it. That same technology is now coming to, to the, what I call the built environment industry. Okay, I don't call it the construction industry anymore, the building industry. It's really the built environment industry because it's much bigger than architects, much bigger than contractors, much bigger than all, these, all the players. So we're, what we're doing, and when you look at the Enuma system, the Enuma system is modeled on those type of systems that you know today on the internet. Okay? And what they're doing is they're giving us the ability to make decisions at points that we never could before. And, and the really cool thing about this is we're gonna, I'm going to show you five student efforts and one of the industrial team's efforts. And I think you'll be, you'll be flabbergasted that the level of detail and quality that happened in a very, very short period of time. Okay, just to start, this is the, and 
this goes back to the uh, Oklahoma City Planning Office. The first seed information for this was taking existing geographic information system data, pushing it into the system, and we and creating a, an environment where we're by saying, hey, hey, I want this building to be a BIM model, be a BIM. I want this building to be a building information model. You could actually, with one click, turn any building that they already that the city already had in their geographic information systems into a model that knew how big it was, knew how much it cost, actually even projected what the operating costs are, things like that. And that's the power that we're talking about, being able to take a system that the city's already invested in, take the information in that system, tag it with the, the fact that we want this to turn into a 3D information model, and suddenly you already have decision-making information. You literally at that point could roll up blocks and sections and districts of the city and start saying, wow, we have an investment of $3 billion in this, state, this area already. How can we throw it away? Or, you know, whatever, almost any other type of um, analysis you want to do, you can already start doing it at that level. Now, we're, we've gone much, much further than this. When Tammy picked me up the other day from the airport, we did a little drive through at, at what turned out to be just, you know, one of those gorgeous sunsets. And so this is looking backwards, back toward from the north, from the north to the south towards the project area. Um, the only only thing I can say is there's not much there. You know, and, and I think this is this photograph is pretty, uh, you know, self-explanatory. Uh, there's a lot, a lot of possibilities, and it actually is a nice. It's, it's actually an area that, you know, if you had a really good apartment in there, you probably want to live. Okay, so let's look at. Let's look at what was done and what came together between uh, 9 o'clock on the 7th and 9 o'clock on the 8th. And I'm going to do my best to recognize the people who did all this work. Okay? But what I want to do is I want to start by just sort of naming a few names. Okay? So, that, so that when I miss your name as we go through this, I don't want anybody getting too wound up because it's just, you know, I. When you have a name like Finance Jernigan, you realize that sometimes things get screwed up with names. Okay, so, so. okay, so what I want to do is first, I um, let, me, let me just run through the four undergraduate teams, and these teams are made up of an architectural student and a construction scientist student. Uh, Amber Conwell and Cole Hickson, I believe, are the first team we're going to look at. Okay, then we're going to look at Eric Medina's and Adam Lacour's work. We're going to then move to uh, Sarah Abdul Halim's and uh, Mitch Wilson's work, then to Amy Shell and Cody Wheeler, then, then the uh, graduate uh, team in construction sciences with Kelsey Fitch, Chris Cossey, and Robert Johnson. And then we're going to look at um, FSBs. Actually, there's several others, others that are kind of remote, because like Balfour Baby was not here, but they were working, helping us remotely. So we're not going to really, we're, we'll show a little of their stuff that ties some things together, but, uh, but we're really going to shift them to FSB and show their work. Once, once I've done that, I'm going to try to go back into the kind of tie things together, put it in context mode, and try to show you some of the things that now that we've got all this wonderful information in the system, that we can do with it. I think it'd be, I think even the students might be surprised how by a, you know, half a day's effort by one person in Pasadena, California, the information that you put together can be uh, pulled out and used for things you may not have thought of. Okay, so uh, just let me just really quick go through this. All the all the teams started by doing the all the traditional. Let's look at wind roses, wind conditions. Let's look at you know what the temperature ranges are, you know, humidity. Um, what is this? <laughs> but they're, we're basically looking at all the you know, climatic data, and all the teams pretty much did it, and we, we decided when we started looking at it, we could have done this five times in this presentation, we figured you only need to see this once, okay? So then, let's look, let's look at what the kind of results that uh, Amber and Cole managed to get at this. 
Okay, so they're they're obviously starting with the with the city's master planning for this area. And I I figured we'd just start these with kind of the money shot, right? So we start with the sex appeal, right? So here's here's the image that um, they were able to develop, and it's partially developed during the process. Um, but you see, they got to, they got to a pretty high level high level of detail, you know, some of the court areas, and then the one of the things about the Enuma system that that I think is often misunderstood. The Enuma system is very low level graphics, and in reality, even though I'm an architect, Mons an architect as well, we found that the graphics are really not not as important as architects think they are, and um, you really do need to represent masses and volumes and be able to look at, you know, it's kind of what's this look like from the street and all that good stuff. But it doesn't really require the high level graphics that sometimes everybody focuses on. And when you eliminate those high level graphics and go to kind of a simple, simplified graphic, it lets you really put all of your energy in the information. And that's what this is doing. So these are some of the screenshots from the system. So you notice they're real, really kind of graphically crude. But these have the information in it that in the past you might not have had once the building was built. Okay, okay so um, during this process, uh, I guess Cole, Cole was running parallel estimates and estimating the, inf with the work that Amber was doing. And they were looking at all the traditional you know, sections, elevations, you know, doing shadow studies, um, looking at other, other model views. And even down to the level of studying some structural system. Okay, so you know, I think I think you you would have to say in a, in a doing scheduling. I think you'd have to say that um, for this short time period, it's, a, it's really a phenomenal amount of work, and, and they really you know owed, owed a you know, good you know congratulations because it's a lot of work it had to be done very quickly, and they did a really good job. Okay, so let's look at Eric Medina's and Adam Dupers. Again, they're starting with the with the city's master plan. They all of the students as part of the uh, the semester. I guess it's all started with precedent studies, and so you know they're where uh, everybody's going in and looking at what other people have done and sort of setting the you know putting putting a context on their own work and looking at you know how how have other people handled similar situations. We kind of we kind of again. There are five of these, four or five of these, so we kind of cut to the, we aren't showing exactly all of them. There's a lot of similarities. But they're getting into things like zoning, demographic issue, issues, and then they're starting to go into modeling, doing mass modeling of their project. You know, looking at where you can see um, parking garages start, I think parking garages starting to happen. They're partially in the ground maybe, and, all the other things that are going on. And then, you know, getting back into, you know, kind of jumping into what they're doing, kind of money shot for their work, uh, where you're, you're starting to, you know, really look at this at a very high level of graphic detail, you know, at least to get people's, you know, minds churning about what it might be. And then starting to look at their back end then to the Enuma system with the very low level models. And, I can't I can't read this from up here, but you are seeing a plan, I think, back there. Uh, it's well washed out, but oh, sorry. Um, but then they're they're basically looking at their project in this is actually in uh, Google Earth plugin, so they're able to look at it in in context and to the extent that Oklahoma City has uh, 3D models in Google Earth, they're able to actually start looking at it in context. Of existing buildings without actually going out and building an existing building model, and some more views of that their project as it starts turning into a real, you know, more of a realized kind of scheme. And they in the within this they they're also estimating. I guess Adams generating the estimates here. And and this this is the kind of thing that people don't always understand about building information modeling. Even at this early, early, early stage, you can start doing drawings that look like they're much, much further down the road. And um, 
just speaking as somebody who's done this a long time, this is actually one of my biggest problems as an architect in doing this, that I'll be generating what look like construction drawings. I'm still on concept. And, and I've had some owners that really, I think, it, I think it's to their best interest to thank their construction documents so they don't have to pay for those other phases, but you know, it's just me. Um, okay, so but plans, you know, all kinds of plans. Um, and again, they're looking at, you know, pile foundations and some structural issues. And, um, you know, so it's, again, for a short cycle, look at a project, get into the details of it, a lot of good work. And Sarah, Sarah Halim and uh, Mitch Wilson's project. Okay, and this one, you know, Brandon, we really appreciate you jumping in and giving the, some good comments across the board. Uh, you know, it, um, it's probably not too visible because it's small, but one of the things that makes this all happen is, is the Enuma system has what's called BIM mail within it, and everybody who's participated hates it at this point, I suspect, because it's like, it's like the world, it's the ultimate spamming system. And you know, basically, what ends up happening within with BIM mail? Anytime you want to send, you want to talk to anybody that's working on the project, you send them a BIM mail, and anybody you send, you know, if you hit send it to everybody, everybody in the project gets it, right? And so there's been a lot of BIM mail over the last few months. A lot of BIM mail. I think I, I actually had to create a new folder in my mail mail to keep track of. But the good thing about BIM mail is what it does is it instead of having mail in isolation and and all of you have probably had situations where you you know somebody claims to have sent you a mail an email and it just never showed up in your email box with vim mail what it does is it attaches this mail to these models directly and so what it starts doing is it starts creating stuff like a trackable a sequence and for what it's worth Part of when we were doing the evaluation of this, um, Hammy was absolutely right that we were looking at collaboration. But just for if you ever do another one, just remember we know what you're doing. <laughs> we have, you know, we really li literally have a time staff stamp record of your pro of your process. Okay, and and just think in terms of that for real projects. You force everybody to use them mail, and then you know when you start running into problems, it's pretty clear who created the problems. Also, and you know, it's pretty pretty nice uh, perspective to rendering here too. I think if I remember what Brandon's comment said, it's something to the effect of, "Wow, the courtyard's really cool, but the windows are too small." <laughs> Paraphrasing. Um, okay, and these aren't going to—you're not going to see this well. This is a plan. This is a fairly, you know, nice um, plan. Many of most of the students work from they work from actually a high complexity BIM tool Revit, and then actually push it back into the Enuma system to extract the information. And so, if you could see this, what you would be seeing is actually a very you know a lot of rooms and spaces and stuff that, uh, and you know getting down to again that's these white ones just don't show up very well on this. But here's more views of the image imagery. And in this one, um, I guess Adam, I'm sorry, this is Mitch's. They, Mitch actually got down to the point of looking at uh, some site staging. You know, where, where would the trailers go? How much room would it take for the trailers? You know, what's, what's gotta be demolished on the site? So they're getting really into the, really getting down into the nitty gritty of this project. And scheduling. And, well, and here's kind of a really good shot pool and sort of a deck area. And this is the kind of stuff, you know, once you have a model, you can do, you can literally do views of anything. Okay, so then, then moving on next, Amy Schell and Cody Wheeler's project. Um, I actually, we had, uh, we picked on Amy a lot during this process. And um, I think she took it okay, but we, we picked on her a lot because she was actually one of the first ones to start plugging stuff in. And um, and Cody was down there working with her, you know, hard at it, and uh, wasn't getting much credit. But uh, I think the, the tw between the two of them, they seem to have one of the more more tight collaborations going on. 
Um, okay, again, they're they're starting with the city's information. They, I think, they were only the only team that actually named their project. Maybe some of the others did. I just missed them, but you know, they they started out by actually calling it something. And I wanted to wanted to show this to you because there's a, there are all kinds of misconceptions that flow around that flow around them. One of the misconceptions is you got to do everything electronically, and that just was not true. Um, and I thought it was nice that when they uploaded their graphics, they had they were showing some of their hand sketching because you know there. I wouldn't say I do this, but there are a lot of people in my generation who really don't like computers much. And um, the the cool part about these systems are if you really use it right, you can still hand sketch. Hand sketching is not a lost art. And it's not even a lost piece of this process. And so it's really good. And I really commend you for actually including and showing and hopefully using the hand sketching to, you know, to move you to where you need it to be. Because this is not all about it all has to be a computer from, from the first instance. You know, it needs to be in the computer because you can't get the data out of it otherwise. But there are plenty of workflows in this that allow, you know, the person who can, can draw like a bandit but can't turn the computer on even to actually function with this. And there's some, some elevation studies. And also there were, there were a lot of, um, there was a lot of physical modeling, and photographs of physical models. So there were, a lot of, there were a lot of different tools used to get to solutions. And that's what, really what this is all about. The, Again, one, another one of the misconceptions that I find a lot is people think, well, I'm going to go buy a copy of Revit, and that's all they need to do this. And it just doesn't work that way. This is really about using the appropriate tool for the, for the job. And it's good. These are, these are good examples of that happening. Um, these are some views in the system again. And then some, you know, some other sort of vignettes of parts of the project. And as, as um, you'll see when we start getting into how to use this, um, most of these projects are bigger in a bread box. And so, Russell, as you start finding developers to do it, these are, these are all a million dollar cost kind of projects. These are some significant projects. <laughs> um, okay, so and, so, and they were doing, I believe, these blue lines, if you can see the rest of it, are um, access studies or fire exiting kind of studies, I would just not believe. You know, so a lot of good work. And one of the, if, you know, we, we just sort of picked four undergraduate projects that, is, that they're not really picked from a design standpoint. They're really picked from the more the collaboration standpoints. But if we were giving a, handing out awards for work, this color study was actually one of the neatest things that came out of it. And if, if you get a chance to, uh, to look at it, it, this color study was really cool. Um, and then, you know, Cody was doing, well, doing all kinds of things, but, you know, one of them was being scheduling. And then some elevation views and estimating. And um, for those of you that are into estimating, they were estimating in uniformat. So this is a fairly uh, constructive constrained, defined, high-level estimating that they were doing. This is not just sort of seat of the pants, go, you know, open RS means, plug in a number. Okay, and then, okay, so that's the, that's the undergraduate um, efforts, and I guess that's it. Let's give them a hand. Good Okay, now let's move on, moving right along here into the uh, graduate team. Okay, so the graduate team's work that we pulled out was uh, Kelsey Fitch, Chris Cossies, and Robert Johnson, as you can read for yourself. Now, they had a whole different process and a whole different assignment on this. And what they were doing is they were looking at three different possibilities. Okay, and they were really focusing more on the development needs and the real estate issues and things like that. So they started like everybody else with that precedent study, but there, as you can see, the precedent study is a little different than the undergraduate ones. And then they started coming in and within the system, they actually stayed within the Enuma system at that high level of information, low level of graphic detail level, much more than the undergraduates did. 
And so you see here they've got an area near the new central uh, park where they're starting to lay out some buildings. And this is how, you know, from a 3D view, the buildings start looking. And what I'm going to do, if, assuming we don't run out of time here, is we'll go into the system and I'll show you this because every one of those little boxes with the names there is actually carrying data about that space that can be rolled up. And they did a, um, this is a, um, their urban hotel inspiration. I understand that they, they really felt that a hotel needed to go down there. And then they had a uh, hubcap out. So I guess all of this is in hubcap out. So, yeah. so they had some other um, massing kind of op possibilities. They looked at, uh, looked at connections and links and existing conditions. And this is their second uh, pass, their second op option within their work. And the third option. And so they're, they're, theirs is hard to show visually. But if you go into their work, you're able to do side, and, and I think, and we'll look at this, you're able to do side by side comparisons. That this one has an operating, this is going to cost this much to operate, the next one's going to cost, you know, you basically got side by side on all kinds of high level details. And I wanted to show. You know, like I said earlier, Alfred Beatty was not in the room. They were coming in. They actually supported some of the webinars. And I only show this because it's, it was kind of an interesting flow. You have the graduate students doing these three project evaluations. Alfred Beatty had a big headquartered in London, very, very large construction company. I know they have a presence in this area. But they, um, Alfred Beatty is using the exact same process as a contractor to do development options for projects. So when they come in and um, they've got somebody who wants them to do a, a design build deliveries and somebody who wants them to do a construction management risk delivery, they use the same process. And, and the, one of the presentations was around this concept. They have a set-based design where they're actually taking three concepts and basically breaking them down into pieces so that they actually end up in a, in a very short period of time, doing a very detailed evaluation of 96 options. And, um, and they're, using all, they're using the Enuma system and Revit and we've done all kinds of other software to do it. But it was kind of interesting that students are doing these sort of three options and right behind it's Balfour for Beatty coming in with their three. And then let me show a, some quick stuff on uh, FSB, FS, F plus S and B. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's... Um, but let me show, show some of the stuff that came out of this because one of the things that happened probably as early as anything, we started noticing the, the sort of curved um, concept popping up down on the river, I guess where the, uh, down where Pool Park is, and down that area of Pool Park is where the, uh, I guess the kayak whitewater area is going to be and stuff. Um, and so we started seeing these, these curved concepts going in. And uh, you know they're kind of they're kind of different. So so they ended up with a uh, coming in with a situation where they actually did quite a lot of uh, quite a lot of modeling, quite a lot of uh, thought about it. Um, I guess they had done some their own precedent studies and some again sketching, hand sketching. See, they're they're coming to the reality of the fact that this can't all be computer. Probably shouldn't be all be computer. And you know, getting this stuff into the system, you know, sometimes with curves when you're working on an internet-based thing, it's a little bit tricky, but they seem to have figured it out. And they actually came out with kind of a master plan for that whole pull apart area that uh, is kind of neat, um, just for what it was worth, and we'll see in a minute. One of the things that the cause of having stuff like this, when we look at the system and what's in the system, you notice that somebody put a road right through the middle to connect to this. And it was probably one of my guys who's never been to Oklahoma City and doesn't realize that the railroad tracks are right there. And, um, and so it's one of the things this does is it, it spurs thinking and talking. Because now what would happen, it would, you would say, wow, is this development important enough that we're going to spend the money to get, get a new access under the railroad at that point? And that's, that's really what this is all about. It's to spur questions and comments. And I left this slide in because there really is nothing to visually see on it. But this was the only, this is, hard, 
AutoCAD Civil 3D. And one of the places that's most behind in the whole BIM world right now is civil engineering. I left this in because it's there. What it's worth. I'm not sure I even know what it is, but it was there. But it's really a good effort that um, that they would have actually, you know, tried to trying to tie in civil too. And another view of uh, looking at that area. I'm still not quite sure I understand the uh, using this little these arcs to uh, pull board board the sailors around or whatever. But so it's, uh, it's kind of cool. Okay. Um, and the other thing, just so, you know, one of the things we try to do in this, and this is actually, these are some comments that came in early on from an architect in Ohio, who's near, near Columbus. Um, as this is all happening, people all over the world are able to look at this, or locally, are able to look at this and put in comments. And so this is a, uh, this is one of the comments that came back. And again, somebody who's never been to Oklahoma City. But talking about wow, you've got this wonderful park starting here. Should you put maybe a green space, a larger green space over the river and over the highway, to make a more, more, a broader, wider, more design connection to the downtown? So this is somebody I know. This is the guy who came up with this, and he's one of the people who's been fighting in the urban areas. These little you know, tiny links <laughs> across barriers. Um, but he, but you get comments like this through the system. Okay, and now with that, so that's, and then I guess before, let's get a hand to the uh, to the uh, team. Uh, yeah, good work. And, uh, yeah, hopefully this is just the start, right? Okay, so what I'm going to do here. Without, um, what I want to do now is I want to get into the um, into the system. And actually, before I get into the system, I'm going to bring up Google Earth. Let me. Um, one of the one of the things we opted. When this whole system was coming together, we we felt that there was a disconnect between planning and architecture, and how you represent buildings in 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 I guess what I call geospace. Okay, so so you we had a situ, there was a situation that buildings are kind of designed as these little clouds in space, and they don't connect to their world, right? And so when we started looking at that, if there are all kinds of planning systems. Um, S3 makes one, ArcGIS. There are all kinds of geographic information systems where planners are doing that kind of stuff. But architects aren't doing much of that connection to the rest of the world. And so being, a, being small operators, you know, not being the 10,000 person firms, we started looking at how do we represent all this architectural work in context. And what we really came to is that Google Earth was really the best source of that. And we, at the time, we were actually working for the federal government a lot. So it was before Google Earth was let out of the spy realm. Because Google Earth, for, if, you, if you don't know, Google Earth started as a, as a thing called Keyhole that the government developed uh, to do spy stuff. Right? And, and it actually came out and you know, it got publicly released. And I suspect without knowing it that the government still has higher levels of this. right? But the, there's some cool things that can happen with this because Google Earth is actually a full bore geographic visioning system is, is one way to describe it. I mean, you can put all kinds of things, you can do stuff, study all kinds of things. So let me just show you a thing that uh, Kamon did. He took, what he did is he took the projects that people have submitted and he pushed them over to Google Earth. And, and everybody who's worked on the system now probably knows how to export to Google Earth. Before he pushed them, though, he gave all the, he actually put the projects on separate sites. So, so because we want to look at this like an urban project, not like just a bunch of things stacked up on top of each other, which is kind of how the projects came in. And he, he actually added some time onto them. And so let me, let's just run this. 
And so basically you start seeing the projects come in. And you notice in the top you've got that you've got a little time clock going on. And we know if I stop if I stop this clock right now, it stopped at uh, May 26, 2014. Okay. So based on a based on adding a time factor to the models that people created, based on placing them on sites, we start seeing a 4D visualization of what can happen that's very easy to change. You can literally take this out as an Excel spreadsheet and adjust the dates, put it back in, and look at it a different way. And so what ends up happening is the red buildings are under construction, and I don't see any, any of them that have gone green yet, but what you'll see, let me turn this back on, and what you'll see is as the projects move forward, you'll start to see some of them turning green as they get built. Okay, so these are green, even though standing here they look gray. But you start basically with 3D visualization with time within Google Earth. And so one of the scenarios here, this goes up through this, this bar, this chart starts from uh, May 12, so it's already started, through uh, April 2018. Okay, so this is a scenario that says in the next uh, six years or so, here's what's going to happen. Okay, so that visualization, I mean, all, all the work the students did and FSB did on these models in, in literally a couple of three hours, Kimon was able to, you know, move them around, put them in a kind of a more of an individual context and add time to them, export them to Google Earth, and now we're able to see this. If we zoom out a little bit on this whole view, spin around a little bit. Now let's look at the result in the Onuma system. In the Onuma system, we have the GIS layers that came in from the uh, Oklahoma City GIS um, maps. They're sitting on a server, so they're accessible to everybody um, in the BIM storm. And you can do things like turn, th turn layers on and off. So for example, we can turn the buildings off, and turn the roadways off and see where the parks are or leave just the streets on. Layered on top of that now what we did is we actually started to uh, reference uh, live the uh, projects from the different teams um, that were working in the BIM storm. So you see these buildings down here. These are actually coming in live reference from those teams, uh, uh, schemes and projects. In other words, if these projects were updated, we'd actually see um, the buildings change shape, for example. We have uh, taken the, uh, the team uh, projects and actually layered them into um, sites, and we've decided to actually, um, there are four, uh, four projects here from the different team members, Amy, uh, Shell, and Cody Wheeler, for example, have a project here on the um, Walker site. And then we place the other four projects uh, directly above them, one, two, three, four up here, and then the other team uh, has their uh, uh, master planning project on the right side here. We've also inserted uh, the other um, 15 projects that came in from the different teams uh, scattered throughout the site, and we still have some of the prototypical buildings uh, layered in as well. So this is the, uh, um, the structure that we're using, and from this structure we can do many different variations very quickly. For example, if we decide that we really want to move uh, a project from uh, one site to another site, it's simply a matter of uh, grabbing it and uh, moving it to, to another site like this, or uh, bringing in another another building from another team uh, uh, that might have designed a different option for that site. So this, this way is really quick. One can quickly uh, analyze different options uh, using the, uh, the input that was generated by the uh, participants in the BIM storm. From these designs now, um, we can actually, um, let's turn off some of the GIS layers and just look strictly at, at uh, the, the projects that came from F, F and BS, for example, is on the right side here. Uh, if we click on the report button, we can generate live reports. This is a live report, uh, an aggregation of all the uh, areas of the site and the cost, uh, the total acreage, 358 acres. As the buildings are added, uh, the total building areas would, would get updated here. We have classified the buildings by omni-class facility types, so for example, residential units, etc. So you get this um, 
live pie chart here, and there's also a, a roll-up of util estimated utility usage, electrical use, and water use, for example, and operations and maintenance costs. These numbers can be adjusted uh, quite a bit in the settings. We left them as default right now. Another report is a building comparison. These are all the buildings. Each column is a building, so you'll see the name of the building and the site and the estimated construction cost and the um, details about the uh, energy use per building now. And uh, occupancy, for example, shows the residential number of residential units, um, utility summary and operations maintenance cost. A lot of these buildings came in from different teams, so some, some of the data is not 100% complete, but at least you have a starting point. Uh, for example, for, for whatever reason, this particular building did not have the energy data entered in it, so it's not actually reporting energy use. But most of the submitted projects actually have the default values or entered values from the teams that are generating energy use per building now. So you can either roll it up at the whole city level or drill down to an individual building. And if the settings are changed, um, these uh, summaries would also get automatically changed. Another view is to look at some of the other uh, reports. Um, for example, you can actually start looking at um, reports about uh, cost summary. This is a, a project by project report. It just scrolls down. So there's many different outputs. Essentially, taking the data from the projects and uh, automatically generating reports from the uh, the geometries that were entered into the project. From here, you can do a lot of exporting. So if we go to export, you can export to Google Earth. You can say I export it by uh, building volume and color code it by time-based and include a 4D timeline. And the result of that would look something like this. So in Google Earth now, uh, we have a timeline on the upper left. This is the starting point 2012. If we hit the play button in Google Earth, it actually starts going through every year. Red means it's under construction, so here come some buildings under construction. Green means it's completed. Uh, you can see the uh, sequence of construction here, and this can easily be changed in an Excel spreadsheet if one wants to try a different variation of the, uh, the scheme or actually duplicate the scheme and, and uh, test different versions of this. Or you can grab the timeline and, and just uh, zoom over to the part to the year that you're interested in, and then zoom into the uh, uh, the part of the city and see what what the density is going to be like. Each of these elements, if you click on a, a block here, for example, a parcel, it gives you the parcel number B10, B12, and the same thing with the building. So if we look at Amy's, uh, Shell, and Cody Wheeler's building here, it actually gives us a summary of that building now in Google Earth with the same data we were looking at earlier in the reports in the Onuma system. So these models actually originated in this case, uh, Amy, Shell, and Cody, I believe, started in, in Revit and imported the resulting Revit model into the Onuma system to give a simple view of the data without having to, to know how to use Revit. In this case, it's a Google Earth view of that with the, uh, the data coming out from uh, the Onuma system server. Uh, same thing with the, the roadways. You can actually click on the roadways. Or if you uh, zoom back and say I want to get an overall view of the project, um, you can actually click on the, uh, the site itself. Any part of the site here actually gives us an aggregated view of, again, the 359 acres, the same data we were looking at earlier, but now inside the Google Earth interface. In Google Earth, you can set up different camera views or, or manually um, zoom in and zoom out with your mouse, or I set up a camera view here, for example, it just will fly over to uh, another part of the site to look at a different angle. Um, the point of this this graphic is not to create a, a beautiful rendering for uh, photorealistic rendering, but to have a rendering of the information and the data. So as a team start trying different options from a planning perspective or from a developer's perspective or a city planning perspective, you can start looking at the implications of uh, the scheduling here. And as one can imagine, there's millions and millions of iterations when you start doing different phasing or different density or different buildings. And you would want to, to study it from many different angles and see what the options there are, there are from uh, a design perspective, from a real estate and a marketing perspective, for example. Uh, keeping the, the graphics simple like this allows you to rapidly view the complex data that started in the projects. Uh, in many cases, uh, they were starting from Revit. Or in some cases, we started from Excel and created these massing models of a residential units as prototypes that could be used 
as a starting point to then take it out into the other building information modeling applications like Revit to do more detailed design. There's no linear process to any of this. The point of the BIM storm here at Oklahoma City was that the resulting buildings that you're seeing here literally were just coming in in the last couple of days. We haven't seen uh, these models appear till very recently and you saw earlier the more detailed rendering, rendered views and the studies that were done and all the data that was collected to come to this point, but now having them in this format allows you to do a lot of different things. So let's go back to um, look at a few, a few um, PowerPoints of this. Um, the Oklahoma City BIM storm started with the um, uh, GIS data in the background. We started mashing up uh, since yesterday the buildings that were coming in from the teams. Uh, we have a year-by-year -year view of the construction that you saw earlier in Google Earth. These are screenshots of that, or you can create output and save the, uh, the graphics for presentation purposes like this. Um, the uh, detailed summary of cost and the utility summary building-by-building -building reports. And the last one I'd like to show is actually what it looks like live on an iPad. So if we have um, an iPad view like this, Let's actually open up the iPad here and get to this in position. There it is. So this is a live view of the iPad. So we're live on the iPad here. And the same data that we saw earlier on the desktop and actually the same models that started from Revit now in a simplified format on an iPad allows many users to access the information without needing to know anything about BIM or the complexities of the tools that were used. So this is a a report from um, one of the projects. Let's go back and look at this project from Eric Medina and Adam LaCours. Or let's look at the project from Amy right here. Amy Shell and Cody Wheeler get the info button on that. It's giving us a summary of the project from Amy and Cody, the square footage and cost and other attributes that are available from it. We can turn on the satellite view and pull in the, the map uh, from the satellite imagery. Uh, this is a mashup of the building information modeling data, the, the, bin, the satellite views and other, other more detailed information. Let's go inside the building that Amy and Cody worked on and look at some of the upper floors. Let's look at the third floor. And there are all the spaces that originated in the, um, uh, the Revit model. And we can actually select multiple spaces. For example, say let's, we want to do a quick analysis of how many square feet we have on the third floor of these selected spaces. I click the Info button. And there it gives you kind of a summary of those spaces. You can do a lot of other things, like you can actually take a photograph or send a message directly from the iPad. So this, this is used a lot, and there's actually the list of all the people that are involved in the project directly from the database. This, as projects like this get more and more complex, it gets incredibly difficult to figure out who's on the team or who can we communicate with. So if, for example, if I wanted to, to send a message to, uh, to Mike Bordenaro here, I could say, well, I'm looking at this building. What do you think of it? Take a look. So from the iPad, I'm, I'm typing in messages. I can uh, even uh, take a photograph. Let me just take a photograph of my screen here while we're looking at. Boom, you take a photograph. Say I'm on the site. I think I think this should happen, this part of, this, out of the, uh, the plan. And I could send this off, and it gets sent as a, as a mail to Mike Bordenaro, who can then see uh, the discussion we're having about this part of the building. It's We have the city at our fingertips now because we have this entire plan with all the buildings that were loaded just uh, a few hours ago, uh, accessible live um, in this uh, interface. And we're just showing one variation of this, but we could very rapidly, within about 20 minutes, we can duplicate this entire site, try a different layout, move the buildings around, try different density, delete buildings that don't make sense, and run another report again. So instead of generating static PDFs and static reports like this, just like on the uh, internet, when you're making an airline reservation, you have the access to the building data at your fingertips to try different options and come to a better conclusion with the, uh, the available data that you have. So back on the desktop now, same data, same buildings we're looking at, but now on the desktop, 
if we were to change this on the desktop and we were collaborating with the team and saying, okay, let's try a different uh, layout of the city here, uh, these changes would actually show up immediately in the uh, other interfaces that we were showing earlier. So with that, let's go back to the conclusion of the slide presentation. If there are any questions, um, the iPad, easy access for all, the live data on tablets, and we thank everybody for being involved with the BIMSTORM Oklahoma City. Thank you very much, and signing off, this is Kimon Onuma from Onuma Inc.